Idly ho there. Hope everyone's well. And life is treating you well. I am here to discuss uh, the 11th of the Gazetteers. I've been doing the the review thing on the Gazetteers of the Mistara setting. Um, and this is the 11th one, the Republic of Dorokin. Now, uh, a few things up front. Uh, this was written by Scott Herring. Um, and also listed internally is William W. Connors. Though Scott Herring is not the only one listed on the cover. Um, Scott Herring uh, only did one other book besides this. So, uh, you know, he was relatively new, I guess, to the, the game writing. He, and he, I think he mainly moved over to other companies after this because this is the only two I could find. Um, but, anyway, um, the public of Daroken is odd. Uh, most of the, uh, the, the cultures in, uh, in most, honestly, in most fantasy settings can be tied to some version of European cultures or, you know, European plus here's a, an Asian analog, you know, the East Asian analog, and here's a, uh, a Middle East analog, you know, there's Arabian, and so on. Most settings kind of break down that way. This one, uh, this particular one, is a, a much more me metropolitan in a lot of ways. Uh, I think the closest analogs would be uh, sort of a late Denmark kind of, you know, after long after the the whole Viking era and more into the trading country, and maybe um, uh, the uh, uh, Venetian, you know, merchant princes and such. It's got a, a an interesting structure in that regard. Um, it's a young uh, kingdom in uh, uh, in the setting uh, com uh, compared to the other history uh, histories listed. It's only fully the nation that it is for about two hundred years. Um, honestly, it's it, it's uh, slightly libertarian leaning in its writing. Uh, it's a plutocracy. And, um, that means it's basically the rich get to rule, uh, and, uh, wealth equals power and respect. And they mean that quite literally. Um, every five years they do a great reckoning in Daroka. Now, this great reckoning is basically, a, an audit for everybody in the country and they see how rich people are and if you are uh, you know of a particular level of wealth then you can hold an office if you're below that level you cannot hold a political office and it goes up from there you know the, the richest rule and um, there is a small tax in the country, but it's really small, uh, and it's gym, uh, small income tax and sales tax, uh, but it's collected on the collected on every sale, and the uh, the the taxes associated with the the readings from the Great uh, Reckoning. Now, uh, the, I mean, it's it, it's a it's got kind of an elaborate tax structures that they talk about quite a bit in the book. Um, and the, uh, the wealth, you know, is, uh, tied to, uh, different ranks ranging from, you know, local mayor to the chancellor, uh, which is the leader of the nation, uh, which is nominated by the inner circle and the council, uh, cho uh, also choose him. And he, 
sort of has the powers of a king, but not really. He's more uh, arbiter in chief in some regards. He's the guy who gets to say, all right, we're going to send the military here. Uh, so he, he's kind of like a king, but he doesn't have the same kind of power that you see in other countries. Now, uh, the uh, other big thing that is a, a, a significant aspect to the, uh, the culture is the Dorokan uh, Diplomatic Corps. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's sort of like a peacekeeping army, I guess. You know, like the UN peacekeeping forces, except it does it with economics. It does it with uh, uh, trade deals and such to make sure that, uh, you know, there are no conflicts that inhibit trade, uh, which, you know, is, is interesting. Uh, really, the, it takes the, the viewpoint that, you know, capitalism, enlightened capitalism can be uh, a source of, of good in the world. Um, they have a small but effective military. They write that up in there. Uh, they talk about the the courts, although courts are very limited. Uh, they really only uh, handle criminal cases. Uh, civil cases are handled by the uh, diplomatic corps, actually. The, uh, the criminal cases, they have two punishments. Essentially, it's uh, economic punishment, which uh, ranges from really advanced fines to as far as indentured servitude to pay off those fines, and death. They don't have a, a whole lot of variation in there. Um, you, know, you either owe somebody money, you either work for that person because you can't pay off that money, or they kill you. That's Those are the options that they give you. Uh, unsurprisingly, the economy section is somewhat extensive in this one. Uh, you know, the, this is broken up like several of them into a game master section and a player section, uh, and which is fine. Uh, it works fine. The... Um, uh, as far as it goes, actually, I um, I think that's a, a good structure going forward for uh, any number of setting products out there. You know, here's the thing you can hand your players so they know the stuff about, you know, the place that you're living in and uh, all the, the really detailed, you know, super insidery stuff. That's in the Game Master section, which is kind of nice. Um Anyways, uh, large economy section, the, um, uh, the, they, they talk about trade relations, caravan trade, there's a lot of caravan trade. This is not unlike the Myth Mithrad Gills, um, uh, Gazetteer, except these guys are mainly land-based. They do have some sea trade, but this is a mainly land-based trade, uh, so caravan trade is much bigger. Um, they talk about merchant houses and guilds, um, talk about the kind of trade and industry that you find in the country. Uh, the, they do talk about the fact that there aren't a lot of uh, non-humans in the country. Um, there are some, uh, because they border on the homelands of a bunch of of non-human races, you know, the, they they border on a lot of nations in general. It's called the na uh, the nation of leftovers, the land of leftovers, due to receiving so many refugees from all the conflicts in all the surrounding lands. Uh, and, uh, it, yeah, it was... Uh, to... to make it a little more clear that sort of multiculturalism I guess is uh, is 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 a good is considered a strength I guess they um, you know they have a bunch of people from all over 
all the surrounding countries as refugees that moved there and became part of their society. So it, uh, it you know, the patchwork nature you know, becomes a, a a thing of pride for them, I guess is a, a good way to p describe that. Now, um, as far as the non-humans, though, there aren't a lot of them there because they don't have a lot of refugees. And generally, those non-human races feel more comfortable in their homelands by the nature of the way things are written up. So, you know, the elves like to stay in Elfheim, which borders on this. Uh, the, uh, the, the halflings like to stay in the, shire, the five shires. The um, dwarves like to live in dwarf home or rock home. And uh, there are orcs nearby uh, as well. They're just generally not welcome anywhere. So whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean that that's they talk about that a little bit. Uh, the uh, the the society section talks a lot about the different classes, social classes, um, and you know ranging up to you know gold and. And, and down from there uh, and uh, you know different social stratas have different expectations tied to them okay um, and I'm going through this in a my notes uh, were written in the I read the game master section first and then the player section which is why I'm kind of uh, skirting some of the stuff I'll, I'll get to what's in the player section towards the end here if you're wondering what the the order of things is. Anyways, um, they talk about what is acceptable uh, as or you know considered too ostentatious. Um, for example, um, it is acceptable for you to have a lot of servants, especially during one of the annual masked balls, but uh, it is considered vulgar to spend excessively on, th say, things that you wear or what have you. Uh, charity is looked down on in this sort of uh, almost libertarian utopia uh, because charity means that uh, uh, you're saying to these people that they can't do it on their own. And that is considered insulting. Um, they got a lot, lot of details about the different cities. Actually, one of the things I, uh, I found interesting here is that there are a number of cities listed here, far more than uh, a lot of the gazetteers. They didn't go with the tactic of here's your starting out adventure hub town. Uh, they instead listed a bunch of different cities uh, and, and gave details about them. They gave, uh, you know, the standard, here are some adventure uh, frameworks for you to do um, at the different tiers of play, basic, expert, master, and so on. They, uh, you know, include some NPC write-ups and and so on, and some conversion rules to convert them to the advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much what you find in the uh, Game Master section. Now in the Player section, uh, it's much more written in a, an in-character voice. Uh, you get a lot of different perspectives from uh, different narrators, essentially, telling you different ways of looking at different aspects of the society. Uh, they have also, uh, you know, as is the case with a number of the gazetteers, in fact, most of them, there are skills introduced, uh, and, you know, describes how to use skills in their respective, uh, uh, nation and, you know, uh, uh, you know, which skills are more likely to be there and so on. They have some actually fairly detailed rules for doing trade missions and you know uh, I buy so much of this thing and take it to this city and resell it for value and so on 
Uh, they have some fairly extensive rules for that. It's probably more rules, honestly, than most people will want to deal with. But it's interesting that it's there, and if you're looking for a good place to, to find rules like that for your role-playing game, this is not a bad one to look at. They also have the Merchant class. Now, the Merchant class is one of those classes that you add on. It's sort of multi-classing, except in a game that, that doesn't really have multi-classing. Uh, but you can devote... Uh, merchant XP and, and take a level of, of, of merchant instead of taking a level of your normal class. Merchant XP is acquired as you uh, gain money because that's how they roll. Uh, and uh, they the overall the uh, the classes have a lot of things uh, to it. It does have some spell casting, mainly spells related to trade. Things like clear sight and, you know, uh, provide food, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's all right. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting take. Uh, I, I think making it a class is maybe going a bit too far, but it's there if you want to use it in your game. Uh, it wouldn't take a lot to convert that into 5th edition, though I would honestly just set up a background in 5th edition if I were doing it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, overall, uh, I liked this gadget here, uh, but I think I like the content more than the, the writing, if that makes sense, which it probably doesn't. I think the setting that this nation would be a great place to run a game. Uh, it's got lots of adventure opportunities, lots of excuses for you to, to travel, lots of things to do beyond just, I'm going to stab the bad guy. Uh, it's got a wide range of terrain, so, you know, everything from deserts to swamps, it's all there. Um... Lots of different uh, cultures to draw on, so anything that you found interesting in some of the other uh, cultures and the other gazetteers, you could sort of bring that in. Um, that, I mean, it, it's got a lot of adventure potential, and the the competition between houses, uh, merchant houses, is is a great one. Uh, the diplomatic corps is a great idea for adventure uh, hook factory. You just you know like. The diplomatic corps needs you to go investigate this and prevent a conflict, so they could send you to other nations and so on. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff there. The actual writing was, eh. Uh, I mean, it's kind of uninspired writing. The design of it was cool, but the writing was, eh. Um, the art's okay. They. You know, you, I read this in the PDF. They, you know, included things in the original that you could cut out and make into, you know, like, here's a wagon for my adventure. Um, so if you wanted a paper cut out of a wagon, you could print off one of the PDFs in here and, and use that as a, a basis to do that. And, and it's got those in there. Um, like a lot of the, the gazetteers, I mean, uh, the, there were a couple of them that had ships, uh, as, uh, cut out, so why not a wagon for a caravan? Sure, it works. Um, but, uh, yeah, overall, I liked it. I think, uh, ultimately my warm feelings from back when I did play in this setting... Uh, boil down to uh, this particular gazetteer in a lot of ways. It's not the only one that I thought, you know, that stuck out in my head. But this one was, here's one that uh, setting that gave you a lot of excuses for lots of different kinds of adventures. And I like a setting to have that. Many of the gazetteers were more strongly flavored. Uh, I think that, you know, for instance, the, uh, uh, 
Emirates of Yalarum has a very strong flavor to it. Uh, this one is less strong than that, and I that's fine. You know, it doesn't have to, they don't all have to be super strong in flavor. Um, but it, it, uh, it does give you a lot of options. Uh, and I think that's probably the most uh, impressive bit in this one. Uh, while I, I say the writing's a bit boring, you know, the, the actual world building here is, is entertaining enough. Um, but, um, yeah. Anyways, that was the, uh, Republic of Dorokin. Uh, and uh, I hope you liked it. I will, uh, uh, you know, move on to the next one. And, uh, it will come in, uh, odd time intervals because I'm weird. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, subscribe, like, share with all the people, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.